So I'm going to talk about transcatheter mitral valve repair and replace. And I think uh, most people acknowledge that this year is the year of mitral valve uh, for many reasons. Um, I, because Eberhard is going to speak on transcatheter mitral valve replacement, my focus of attention will be the mitral clip. Um, how do you go forward to this left hand? Left. No, it's not. Oh, this one, yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. It's not working. It's a big green one. Oh, you pointed that, like that. Okay. okay, sorry. So um, this topic is very important because Eberhard Grube is sitting in front of me. Four years ago, uh, Eberhard described the microclip as a Band-Aid. So I have to actually prove that it is actually a Band-Aid. And Band-Aid is such a good thing, by the way. The mitral clip is a primary uh, transcatheter treatment option uh, for selected patients with MR, and there are over 60,000 cases being performed with this Band-Aid. And there's evidence of safety, efficacy, and even durability of this Band-Aid. And there's now new exciting data for functional MR, and, and TMVR is in early clinical stages. So when you understand the treatment for mitral regurgitation, I would like to classify it into treatment of primary MR and secondary MR. And primary MR, predominantly in, in the Western society, would be degenerative. Low and intermediate risk is surgical repair, if possible, if not replacement. And for high-risk patients, it's mitroclip. That's actually approved. When it comes to secondary functional MR, it's quite controversial whether you should actually treat these patients. The role of surgery is quite controversial. There's no consensus whether you should replace or repair the valve. And trials for ring aneuroplasty and replacement have been done. And the mitoclip could be a reasonable op option. And that's what I'm going to show you. This is the uh, surgical data from uh, basically an ischemic MR, where they actually try to compare ring aneuroplasty versus the actual trans uh, mitral valve replacement. I, I want to repeat, not ring aneuroplasty, not just repair. And you can see in this randomized trial, which is not a large study, which took them six years to enroll, 3,000 patients to get only 251, and they actually enrolled 125 to ring adenoplasty, 126 to replacement, and the follow-up was for two years. And the endpoint was LV end systolic volume index. I've never heard of an endpoint like this. Have you? It doesn't make any sense to me. So you've got to have patients say, oh, by the way, I want to change your end systolic volume index, so I'd like to put you in a study. So no clinical follow-ups, okay? So the, what it was found is there was no significant difference between the end systolic volume index or remodeling at 12 months and two years. And in the surviving patients, there was a higher degree of recurrence of MR, moderate or moderate to severe, in the patients who had a ring aneuroplasty versus replacement. However, if you look very carefully, most of them were moderate, not severe. And in the repair group, the 12-month end systolic volume index was actually higher than those who had a good repair. So if you had a good repair, it was very good. But if you look at the total population, there was actually no difference. So basically, this was a negative study. And this is the uh, difference in the replacement and death mortality. So the absolute mortality was slightly higher in the replacement group versus the repair group, but not statistically significant. If you look at death and MR, you can see over here, there's, if the light blue, light blue and the light whitish is actually death. And just look numerically from a distance, a layperson, which group would you like to be in? We have more deaths actually in the replacement arm rather than the repair arm. So it really didn't show much of a difference. So the conclusion was among patients with severe ischemic MR who assigned to mitral valve repair or replacement, there was no significant difference between LV remodeling at one or two years. And MR recurred more frequently in the repair group, which resulted in more heart failure admissions. So now we go to the mitroclip. The mitroclip, which is the transcatheter treatment. I'm not going to discuss the details of how you do the procedure. Most people know about it, and they're actually going to see a live case soon just now. So I'm going to show you five-year data of the Everest to high-risk registry and then treatment of functional MR. When you look at the five-year data, you can see over here um, that uh, this is the data for the first high-risk registry, which is only 78 patients. You can see that the 
uh, mortality at five years was around 50 percent. It was slightly worse if you did not get a good reduction of MR in the beginning. But what is important is for those who survived, the MR grade was two plus or less in 75 percent of patients. And there was reduction in LV systolic and end diastolic volumes, as well as in clinical improvement in the surviving patients. So this goes against Dr. Grube's point that this is a band-aid. <laughs> okay. So now we'll let's talk about MitoClip results of the functional MR. And I remember you were in the audience, not in the audience when we decided this. But this is the French study uh, where they actually did a study of MitoClip versus medical therapy in patients with functional MR. This study was sponsored by the government and not by industry. And so it was purely an investigative media study. They wanted to evaluate the role of mitoclip plus medical therapy versus medical alone in patients with heart failure, low EFs, and secondary MR. And their primary endpoint was a composite of all-cause death or unplanned hospitalizations for heart failure at 12 months. And the inclusion criteria was an EF of between 15 and 40%. They had to be NYJ class two, and they had to have a severe secondary MR. And here's one problem. They call severe MR as an ERO of greater than 0.2, which in the US criteria would be considered as moderate. So this is a, one of the differences between the European study and the US trial. And if you can see in the randomization, they randomized 152 patients. But look at it, that 43 patients were excluded after randomization. I've never seen a study where one third of the patients were excluded after randomization. What is it? it doesn't make any sense, and I don't understand whether there can be any power left if you have one-third patients lost after randomization. So you have only 102 patients. And so if you see that, the primary composite endpoint and all-cause death and unplanned hospitalizations, basically there was no difference between mitoclip plus versus heart failure versus just medical treatment. And so this, we thought, was the death knell for mitoclip. And Eberhard Grube said, see, I told you, Cybel, it's a Band-Aid. If you look at the data over here carefully, and this is a small subset, if you took patients with very severe MR, there was actually slightly ERO greater than 0.4, you can see the mitoclip did better than the medical arm. The confidence intervals are large because it was a small number. It's suggesting that if they took patients with more severe MR, they might have shown a benefit. It's like saying, if you take a patient with a 50% coronary artery lesion, you put, a left, you put a stent in, it won't make a difference. So there's the limitations of the mitoc France is small numbers, multiple exclusions, included patients with less severe degree of MR. There was no central eligibility committee. Basically, each hospital decided by itself. They sat down three together, they had a glass of champagne, and they said, okay, let's put this patient in the study. So there was no central committee. There was a high initial failure rate. There was a lot of missing data on quality of life. And they were inexperienced operators. The French don't like me to say this, but they only had five cases done before. And there was a high rate of recurrence of MR at one year. And of course, it was a one-year follow-up. And then when we were also depressed, on September 28th, everything changed when we actually showed the data of the QAP trial. Now, the QAP trial is a similar study including ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with ejection fractions of 20 to 50% and NYHA class two, not in cardiogenic shock, had to have one hospitalization in one year or a BNP greater than 300. The primary endpoint was effectiveness was rehospitalizations over 24 months. And there were multiple safety endpoints as a safety issue. And then you had this is the actual randomization. It's a very large study where there was about 600 patients enrolled, 305, 302 the mitoclip arm, 312 to guideline-directed medical treatment. It took five years to enroll. So it took a long time to enroll. And the all-cause hospitalizations for heart failure over 24 months, you can see this is the admissions of heart failure in patients who undergo medical treatment. 283 admissions in 151 patients over 24 months. And then if you look at the uh, treatment arm with the mitoclip, there was actually a dramatic difference in heart failure admissions. I have never seen a heart failure trial with such a dramatic delta. In fact, the number needed to treat to save one patient from heart failure in, one, in two years is only three patients. 
If you now look at the primary safety endpoint, we met most of the safety endpoints, but we had a threshold of 88%, and you can see it there that 95% of people did not have any side effects from this procedure up till one year. When it came to secondary endpoints, there were 10 secondary endpoints. And look at all these secondary endpoints, MR grade, all-cause mortality, quality of life, NYHA class, end systolic volume changes, all-cause mortality at 24 months. So there were 10 endpoints, each of them powered individually, and this is what the results were. They were statistically significant in all 10 secondary endpoints. I have never seen a heart failure trial where you have 10 secondary endpoints met with this degree of mortality. And then finally, when it comes to all-cause mortality, something which we never expected to show a difference in mortality, because these were a very sick group of patients. And you can see the actual mortality was 46% in the patients who were optimally medically managed over two years. And then if you look at the mortality in the device arm, it was 29% at this thing. So the absolute difference was 17%. And therefore, the number needed to treat to save one life is only 59 the only other study which was better than this was TAVR for inoperable patients where it was five patients. So you just have to treat six patients to save one life. Why were the two different studies done differently? So I was asked this question, why were they different? So I'm going to tell you the answer what I told the, first I'm going to tell you the objective answer, then I'll tell you what I actually told the investment committee. When it comes to uh, differences, you can see that the French people took a different criteria. The ERO, the uh, uh, MR grade was slightly less compared to what the US standards were. And I think this makes a difference because if you treat moderate MR, you, you made it a shaken treatment. The second thing is that the, in the US trial, the patients were optimized prior to enrollment. They were fully optimized and then they were randomized. So that means there could be no changes in medical therapy after they got randomized because it was controlled. And third, you can see the results. There's actually a difference. The procedural complication was 15% in the French study. It was 8.5 in the US trial. And the MR grade greater than 2 plus at one year was 17% in the French study compared to 5%. So the overall results were actually good. So when they actually asked me in the investment conference, what do you feel about the differences? I had said, France makes very good wines. <laughs> Maybe they should focus on that. And then they asked me another question, what would you do? I said, well, if you have severe mitral regurgitation and you're not a great surgical candidate in France, the safest place to go is the airport. They didn't like that too. In conclusions, in patients with heart failure with moderate to severe or severe secondary MR who remain symptomatic despite maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical treatment, transcatheter mitral valve leaflet approximation with the mitral clip affords a safe, durable reduction of MR, reduces the rate of heart failure admissions, improves survival, quality of life, and functional capacity over 24 months. What are the implications of this data? In the patients with severe secondary MR, with a suitable anatomy, obviously not all cases, despite maximal treatment, mitroclip should be considered as the first line treatment, irrespective of the surgical risk. This is something which the people will not like me to say this, because the role of surgery in functional MR is still questionable. All other surgical or transcatheter mitral valve repair or replacement options for secondary MR should be evaluated against the mitoclip. And this is, of course, in the New York Times, a tiny device in a huge advance to your heart failure. Thank you very much. Well, I know you're right, but so is everybody else. So, um, so thank you. Thank you for that. You know, uh, no, don't go, because I'm going to tell, say something. Um, you know, um, I just met, uh, I was at a meeting last week, and I met with Milton Packer. He's a heart failure uh, specialist. Everyone knows him. He used to be at, with us at Mount Sinai, brilliant man. And he said he's figured it all out. It's actually exactly the same, that mitral FR and co actually had the exact same results 
if you use the Gorlin hydraulic formula and actually look at the effective orifice area. And I think he makes a really, really good point. He has a paper that's going to come out in a couple of weeks in Jack Imaging where he actually explains so that you don't have to tell the French people to go and <laughs> get on an airplane. They just have to choose the right patients Correct. who will benefit from this therapy. And I think that's the important, important message well, that you're saying. Yeah, actually, I'm sorry I've been so obnoxious, but... <laughs> Uh, but that's for fun. But really, these two trials were actually complementary. I actually talked to Professor Vardia after the lectures, and I told him, look, it was very important that these two studies took place. And the reason for that is, let's say we only had a mitrofran study, and there was no coapt. People would say, mitrofran is dead, let's, everything's over. Let's say there was only coapt positive, right, and no mitrofran. Then everyone would be getting a mitroclip. Right. They, they would, the average reps would go and say, okay, you've got mild MR, put a clip in, because it's going to become severe next morning, just put a clip in. You've got but some watch. avid people here, they wouldn't no, do they that should either. Know that. No, Be no, careful. They, no, they will do that. And now what right. we learned, what patients to treat and what patients not to treat. So therefore, it was complementary to each other. Excellent. Great.